Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Welcome to Phoenix Business Radio, broadcasting live from within the Business Radio X studio inside Max 6 Workspace and the Conscious Capitalism Arizona headquarters here in Tempe, Arizona where we help build businesses and connect you with the right people. I'm your producer today and Phoenix Business Radio Ambassador Kendra Maples, and your host today is going to be the lovely owner, Karen Nowicki. Welcome. We're looking forward to a fantastic conversation, and let's get into the meat of it right away. I'd like to first introduce you to four fabulous business representatives. We have, uh, we'll go left to right. How about that? We have David Bird, uh, di- Creative Director with Original Crew Company. Welcome, sir. Thank, thank you. Happy to have you. Tell just briefly uh, who you are and what you do. I'm mean, when, I, when I say briefly, like, you know, you can go on for a while. we got an sure. hour here, but tell us a little bit about David and Original Crew Company. Sure. I'm originally from the Midwest. Uh, father was in the military, so we bounced around a lot, uh, but ended up settling in Chicago. Uh, moved out to Phoenix about six years ago uh, with another job. Uh, ended up starting up my own company, the Original Crew Company. Uh, we do creative graphic design, digital marketing. Um, so we do production, so podcasts like this one. Uh, we do commercials, video shoots, uh, photography, uh, website design, graphic design, digital marketing, community building, and things like that. And what brought you to Arizona? Promotion, actually, from another company I was and with then you previously. Left. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very yeah. good. A lot of great opportunities here, which is, I think, a big part of what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Well, thanks for being here. Thank you for And having me. Eric Strafel, founder of Summit. Yeah, excited to be here, Karen. Happy to have you. Tell us about Summit and a little bit about Eric. Yeah, so I started out my career in big organizations working across aerospace and defense, a lot of different companies, a lot of different cities moving around, got exposure to small companies partway through that and left a big company, went to a small startup and kind of caught that startup bug. And in the meantime, working for big companies, you have a chance to give back. And uh, a lot of big companies have a corporate philanthropy philanthropy or support uh, social causes. And so I put those two together a couple years ago, really had a deep desire to uh, contribute back and uh, found some things I'm really passionate about, which are supporting small businesses to make a bigger impact. And that was where Summit was born. So I was introduced to the people in this room and some great entrepreneurs, and we've all come together to try to create a business that can uh, become a community for entrepreneurs to scale and and grow their businesses with purpose. And uh, it's been an exciting journey. Love that. And from aerospace now to entrepreneurship, Draw the line for me because it seems like it's a pretty big leap. Yeah, I mean, aerospace, you're dealing with, especially these days, a lot of advanced technology. So everything from autonomy to data fusion. And and so you see the advances in technology and information flow and how that is shaping uh, the global landscape. And so I think there's a bit of those big macro trends in the world that feed into shaping the rest of the the rest of the ecosystem. And so that plays into it a little bit. But ultimately, you know, small companies, technology enabled, uh, can leverage a lot of that. And uh, also working in big companies, you get a lot of access to big thinkers, a lot of the big consulting companies and the best strategists in the world. And so bringing that back down into something that smaller companies can use to scale has been uh, really fun. Love it. Good. Thank you, Eric, for the introduction. And next to Eric, we have Robin Robin Brahman. I don't know why I want to trip over that. Uh, <laughs> Chief Operating Officer over at Cahoots. Welcome. Thank you. Tell our list. I know who Cahoots is, obviously. Tell us a little bit about yourself and then Cahoots and what you do over there. Sure, sure. Um, well, Cahoots has been around for 10 years. It's now in its 10-year it's mark. 10. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, first co-working location in Arizona to start up, um, owned by Jenny and Odine. Um uh, I go back a few years here in Arizona. Um, I started my, and my roots were in corporate world as well um, with Banner Health System for 10 years and strategic planning. And so I've always been in that side along with branding. So I um, have worked for several different interactive companies and some digital agencies in town. Um, and I started my own business and I was looking for a co-working place 10 years ago. I was working you know, part-time as a consultant at Banner at the time and found Cahoots and started my own branding agency. So um, have been doing that over the 10-year mark um, in personal branding, executive branding, um, business branding, and then corporate branding. So I kind of stretched everywhere in this mark. Um, so I've been doing that for the last 10 years. I was in and out of Cahoots working with a lot of different companies. Some would bring me on for a longer contract to support. And then most recently started as the chief operating officer with 
Jenny in this last Oh, I just started in this year, 2020. So I'm um, hoping to get national expansion and programming going for Cahoots. I have no doubt y'all are going to achieve that. <laughs> they, you all are jetpacks and rollerblades over there, right? <laughs> yeah, it's fa- exactly. fast and furious. I exactly. love it. Well, thank you for taking time to come and join us today. Thanks. And Judson Garrett is the gentleman who we get to thank for this opportunity. We got to meet at the Local First Summit we did. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, and um, it was um very evident that we needed to have Eric and gang on here. So thank you for doing that. And Judson is the Chief Learning Officer at Summit with Eric. Tell us a little bit about your role and anything else you might want to add about Summit before we get into the meat of our conversation. Yes, I'm in an envious position with Summit. I'm helping to build the ecosystem by finding like-minded folks people who care about leadership in business, who uh, also have a purpose beyond just extracting profits. And a lot of that comes from interacting with your employees in a way that brings out the best in them. So the real job of a leader is to help people become leaders themselves in whatever role they have and the capacities that they have within the company or an organization. So uh, I met Eric a few months back through Robin, and we found that we shared a lot of values I also have a a background in education and uh, teaching history as well as working with entrepreneurs has taught me a lot about leadership. Oftentimes, these are maybe not positive examples, but examples of where leadership is lacking. The other thing that I've witnessed a lot is the need for the uh, adoption of an entrepreneur entrepreneurial mindset within organizations, large and small, so that people think about launching businesses as part of entrepreneurship. The other element, though, is being able to work with collaborative teams. And just like uh, those of us around the table today, we're brought together through project-based work and contracts. And this is a new way that people are coming together and finding shared purposes and shared goals without the traditional hierarchy of a large organization, which I find fascinating. I I do too. Uh, also from education, although you were um, secondary education. Both, right? yeah. yes. I've taught at ASU, most recently at Grand Canyon University, but I spent 10 years in K-12 Okay. as a uh, founding faculty member for one of the Great Hearts Academies here that in the Valley at Scottsdale that. Prep. Right. Yes. And then I went on to lead the history department at Phoenix Country Day School. Okay. I didn't know that tidbit. I was thinking just higher ed. I um was an assistant principal and third grade teacher in Kyrene School District here in the East Valley for years in the early 90s. Uh, and then had an internship at Intel two summers, paid internship while everybody else was getting to have the summer off. I was, you know, fast and excited at Intel. And for me, that's where I got the energy and the excitement around opening my own business. I thought, my gosh, if I can be a value to a big company like Intel, then maybe there's more for me outside of the classroom walls, which most people say, oh my gosh, we we need great teachers. I just needed to expand. Mm -hmm. And I know you are similar to that. And I I share that because you mentioned something about values and purpose. So as an educator, I think most educators, we come into teaching because we we have a bigger purpose, right? We want to be there to educate and help uh, encourage kids to greatness. I don't know that we've always seen that in businesses. For years, we've seen that businesses was a means to an end, and it was an opportunity to just make a lot of money, right? So at the beginning of our conversation, we mentioned Conscious Capitalism of Arizona. Mm -hmm. That's one of our headquarter uh, location sponsors. Let's talk a little bit about values and purpose. You mentioned that you and Eric share the same set of values. When you are working on creating a culture, and I'll, I'll have any of you speak to this, when you're creating a culture within a company, how important it is, is it to find that those common values? And then where does purpose get born out of that? Yeah, I guess I'll start now. I'll, I'll open up with, you know, the when I first got into corporate America, we started to talk about culture fit when we would, were hiring people. And I had a chance to speak with a bunch of executives at LinkedIn. And at LinkedIn, they talk about culture ad. And so when they're hiring, they're hiring for people that can add something to their culture, not that fit within the box of what they Mm. perceive their culture to be. And I think that's a really important perspective in that with all of us, we all bring very different backgrounds, right? We all come at it from different perspectives, yet we have shared values in what we do. And I do think if you can break down into what are what are your values as people and as an organization, I think in general, people's values are more common than they think. So I think it's a way to build bridges. Uh, across different generations of people, different backgrounds of people. And if you can get down to some of those core values, I think you can uh, you can build those bridges that allow you then to build on ideas together. And, and that was really important, I think, uh, uh, 
uh, enlightenment for me. Yeah, I think the commonality of those values is important because sometimes the strategy or the tactic to achieving them are different. But when you step back and you recognize that you're trying to achieve the same goal, suddenly those values uh, become a lot more apparent as being shared. Yeah. I think it creates a foundation or some guardrails too, doesn't it? <laughs> that if we haven't had that conversation about values and purpose, we might all go out and start doing our projects and get mm-hmm. get lost and then we come back. Is that part of what you offer when you're working with organizations? Yeah, and a bit of it is your so your values start to your values come from an identity in a belief system and philosophies. And if you can align on that and develop a shared identity and what you're trying to do and align on your values, then you can be more explicit about your actions and how you engage with your employees and your customers. And so the biggest thing you see with the dynamics today is every time you have a chance to interact with a customer is a chance to represent your brand and what you represent and a chance to share your purpose, a chance to strengthen that relationship and build authenticity. Yeah. And the biggest thing I see today is that with so much change going on and, and people, uh, sometimes people tend to want to uh, work in ways that align with or with different uh, things going on around them versus falling back on their core values. As soon as you get off track from your core values, you're not being authentic to yourself. And so if you hold on to your values, if you write them down, if you talk about them as a team and you start to live within those values, you can be more authentic. Then you build trust with your customers. It feeds into your brand. And then you can just develop stronger relationships across the board. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing that we witness sometimes is a successful business will reach a plateau and then the CEO, the entrepreneur has difficulty delegating. And the more Mm -hmm. that you share your vision, the more that your employees uh, understand the values that you are building your business upon and see their role as directly connected to that vision, it's easier to delegate and to trust. I don't remember which company it is. Maybe one of you might remember. And I know there's several examples like this, but I just got a visual as you're sharing that about a gentleman who is a janitor at a company or even a guy who's running the forklift. And when folks have come in and interviewed for these larger companies, somebody that you might think is kind of, you know, towards the end tier of the organization, that person knows exactly what their role is in that organization as it relates to the mission and the purpose and everything like that. So I I can see how that really does make a huge difference. How important is uh, purpose and, and values for both of your organizations, for your company? Are, uh, how, do, you have a, do you have a large team or now that you're a business owner on your own, is it smaller than what you've done in the past? Yeah, it's, it's a smaller team. So yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, it's primarily driven by me, but then I also contract out other people and then I have a few employees as well. So we're, we're a pretty nimble team. Um, we kind of just scale as we need to uh, with the jobs that we have kind of currently going on. So when, when this is a great conversation when we talk about purpose and you're working with contractors, right? They're not necessarily people who show up in that workspace every day and, and everybody has their own purpose, right, in, in coming together. How important is it for then people to share purpose and common values in that type of scenario, which really is, I think, what we're talking about here overall, right? Not just the large corporation. We're talking about those, the meshing of uh, different organizations and companies and individuals. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, uh, I think, at least in my experience, it's hard to kind of disseminate that across people if they're not in your day to day every single day. Um, so a lot of times, once you find someone that kind of is aligned with your purpose and values, you hold on to them. Yes. Um, and then it's almost like they are a part of, of your organization, even if you're working with them in a contract basis. And then a lot of times you'll find also that it's like a, a you know, six degrees of separation. So once you find someone who shares that, they know someone else and they know someone else and they know someone else. So you get kind of referred out to a group of people and just, that your web just kind of grows and gets bigger. I love that, it's don't kind of you? It's law of attraction. It is the law yeah, of attraction. We, and yeah. that's and so we need to be really clear about what we're attracting. <laughs> right. And that's part of what you offer as well, right? This this whole mindfulness piece to Summit. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. And then I want to make sure I go back to Robin too and talk about Cahoots. <laughs> She's yeah, like, that's okay. <laughs> it is, and I can lead into a bit of how Cahoots played into it. So, you know, as I start to think about what am I really trying to do, and when you get back into authenticity, one of the things with mindfulness in that practice is you have to be comfortable with who you are before you can get to where you're trying to go. And if you're not comfortable with who you are, which is being, you know, being comfortable in your own shoes, starting to understand your strengths, your passions, your identity, then you can start to build on where you're going. And I think mindfulness is just to take a step back. You know, everybody has ambitions or in, in a history, but take a step back, push that aside for a second, 
And in this moment, think about who, who are you? What do you value? And without outside influences shaping that, and once you can get comfortable with that and who you are and that that's good enough, then you can start to talk about where you're going. And so as, uh, as I started to talk about the mission and vision of where we wanted to go and started to uh, work with this team and others, you know, when I pull in somebody like Jenny and Robin at Cahoots, as soon as I mentioned we're trying to build an inclusive ecosystem, that as soon as I say that, they're on board, right? Because they're, they're trying to do the same thing. And so at some point, you know, you the more we think of a higher purpose, so I start out with trying to help companies. Okay, well, what are you really trying to do? Well, I want to help companies scale. Well, what are you really trying to do? Well, I'm trying to create a more inclusive ecosystem by helping companies that believe in diversity, inclusion, and purpose at the core scale and grow bigger to reshape the entire ecosystem in the global economy. Okay, got it. And that's where like Robin and Jenny are all over it and, and uh, they're trying to do the same thing in their own way. And that's where we start to really come together. I mean, it's it, it's interesting because I look way back and I always say, who do you bench your brand with? And you have to be very careful that when you're benching your brand, you're sitting next to people that you trust and that trust your value system as well. So um, I've done a, a lot of talks around that. And, and early on, um, I was introduced to Eric through another brand strategist that is a person I know well in Texas. And um, at first, I, <laughs> I was like, I don't know, another executive. Oh, no, I don't know. And we um, go in a little bruise. Don't we? We yeah. get a little nervous. Yeah, I did. And it, then I then I got on the phone with Eric. And after I think the second call and we were doing, we were videoing, you know, because we could see each other. I'm like, oh, this guy shows up at his home office in a T-shirt. This is awesome. I can I can work with this. And part of that is just that that corporate bureaucratic feeling I had was I was like, oh, I, I don't I don't want to move through that. It's going to take too long. And the world is going so fast. So values wise for me, it was a person in Texas that I really, really respected. She's a person there that I was like, oh, my gosh, OK, I've got to If I'm going to take this on, I have to do it really, really well because I'm I'm representing her as well. So each person in this process is somebody I bring in very carefully. You know, it started with me. Valerie brought it to me. Then it was to Jenny, Judson, David. It's like it's just evolved into this amazing team. And it's very specific core people that have very uh, important experience that bring to the table. Um, and each of the way, I would present them to Eric and he would decide, you know, if this is a good person in this process or not. So I respected that. Now we became a team in, in how we move forward. Um, and now I do that day to day with Judson being here with me. So um, each person becomes a really important core person. And uh, a person behind the scenes right now that you can't see is Patrick. So we're bringing him in the core now. Um, so we, I feel really fortunate that we have these uh, this ability to do this. And it does happen because of cahoots and the ecosystem that Jenny has built, but the respect that she plays in, in this as well is so important. She's bringing together his insights into a, a core workbook that is being presented in a way that would never happen in the corporate world. Um, so all of that in itself is how careful we are in the process with each step that we're making um, really speaks to the values of each person in the team. So love it. Deliberate. Yeah. Diligent <laughs> is is what I hear you saying. And and uh, it's there's great joy in connecting with people when you get eyeball to eyeball, even if it is through a conference call yeah. and you can sense, wow, this is somebody who I can really it, it makes sense. I felt that Judson mm -hmm. when we met briefly uh, over lunch or during lunch, Instantly, I should say. We didn't yeah. share a meal together, mm -hmm. but we got to connect and it, we're vetting, aren't we? Vetting yeah. each other when we're having those conversations. So the more clarity, as Eric pointed out, that we can have within who we are and what our goals are, it's it's wonderful when you can find a group of people. Uh, Patrick and I have done some uh, work together. I got to be uh, on his uh, one of his entrepreneurial series not too long ago. So when he came in this morning, it was already set up. Kendra's like, oh, you already know Patrick? <laughs> but that's how it is. I feel like that's uh, one of the most special things about being part of the Metro Phoenix area. Um, as each of you have come from, well, m most of you have come from outside of the, the state. Have you found that Arizona is kind of unique in that we are able to really collaborate and come across? Or are you finding that that's really, you know, in the other places that you've been as well? Yeah, I think it depends on the strength of your network to a certain degree. But Excellent. also, I think the Phoenix community is is good about getting their tentacles out and pushing each other along. I've been in other places like Chicago, for instance. I think it's a little bit harder people are a little more guarded in that sense to where it's like once they 
get a job or if they don't want it, they're not pushing you forward to it. It's they kind of just are quiet about it and it kind of just goes away. Where I really feel like the ecosystem here is always pushing the next person up and the next person in line. So if you're not going to take it, it's, well, hey, I know somebody that does that. Hey, I know somebody that does that. Um, so somebody is always being promoted and pushed to the forefront. Yeah, and I'm in Dallas, Texas. So I don't, you know, I left uh, Arizona in 2006. So it's been quite a while and it's changed an awful lot since uh, since we left. But, uh, you know, it's amazing to see the growth here. And I have to say, Robin has been the master connector for me. So I don't know if it's the market here and how great it is or if it's just the, it's Robin. the network that Robin has. <laughs> yeah. but, it's too, but, too. but, oh my gosh, yeah. see, everybody I know here has been largely through Robin, including Judson, mm -hmm. Patrick, David, and and Jenny and... And to David's point, though, the one of the first things you just said is it's around who you're attracting. I mean, we, we said yeah. that a few moments ago. It's you know who are who are you who are you being, and then we're attracting those people. So kudos to Robin and <laughs> all of you. Anything yeah. else to add to this piece from either of you? I think so, we, we benefit from not being Silicon Valley. That uh, we can't hold ourselves up to those kinds of attitudes and standards, which means we can be more open, vulnerable, and collaborative in our startup community. And just as David suggested, it seems like every time I have a problem, uh, a couple people step up and say whether maybe they can't help me, but they know someone who can. And they don't have any sense of, oh, if you're successful, then I'm losing. There's a real win-win attitude that uh, being around Robin in particular and in cahoots is is part of their value system and, and part of the community that they're building there. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, I think that, um, I mean, in 2017, I, I reached out to an outside community into Colorado and and started working with um, Lizelle, who did, starts Women Who Start Up program. And I was doing um, monthly um, interviews of women at Galvanize. You know, I've definitely had an opportunity. I've spent time at Fabric as well. There's some amazing places out there that you can co-work and you can also exist and build business. But I've learned so much um, through Jenny over the last 10 years that it's really about the universities, about the colleges. It's about cities. It's, you know, government opportunities that exist for, you know, all kinds of businesses have, there's resources everywhere. Um, we get a little tired of hearing about Stanford and Silicon Valley and New York and Boston, um, which I don't think it has to be on the outskirts. I think um, we're also working closely with a company out of Colorado right now that's uh, building your FICO score for your business. So it's there's so many resources that are Midwest, um, you know, Southwest, um, but the ecosystem has grown. I think it's more national than it is just local. Um, we have an amazing local um, opportunities here in Arizona that we have brought to bear for Eric, but we also have reached out to some in Texas when we were visiting. So I think it's there. I think it's a matter of of reaching out and finding, like you said originally, how are they a fit? Are they a fit with your culture? Are they a fit with your purpose? And if they are, then you know, start bringing them forward and see how they can start to help a company grow faster. Yeah, I think a, another interesting thing is having worked for, you know, privately owned companies, it's who you don't control who you work with. It's they're hired and you're on a team and sometimes you have to kind of force the fit um, where there is friction, where this kind of environment that, that has been cultivated, at least on the summit team, it it's just been so much more organic. And I feel like it it gets a lot of the the stuff out of the way that you normally would, would trip over or struggle with in terms of team building and working together, um, having those, you know, shared values and common purposes to be able to kind of push the narrative forward. Tell me a little bit about employees since you touched on that. And this is really, again, open to everybody. Why is it so difficult to retain employees and, and keep them excited about what they're doing? Yeah, I, so I think it starts with employees today have an expectation for personal growth that a lot of entrepreneurs have for their business growth. And so when I came out of college um, back in the 90s, you know, I had a pretty methodical career plan and it was I'll do this for one or two years and I'll do this for one or two years and I'll grow the kind of the building blocks of a career. These days, you can get information so fast and you can really push your learning so fast that I, I think a lot of uh, employees are just, they have a high bar for how they want to grow and how they want to contribute. 
And so we as companies need to find ways to allow that personal growth to thrive and uh, in combination with the business growth. And to pull those two together, if one gets out in front of the other, if your business is growing faster than your employees, then that's one of the failure modes that we see in small companies, especially in scaling. Or if your employees are growing faster uh, than your business will allow, then your employees leave and they go try something else. And so I think the pace of, of just the ability to grow both personally and as a business is significant these days. Mm-hmm. It's just the nature of the ecosystem these days. In matching those two up, so you're supporting both in balance is really important. I, I just dropped my kiddo off at a sleepover yesterday and hadn't seen this friend, this mom, for several months. And she, um, last time we talked about her business, she works for an educational company, um, an online educational company. And she was very frustrated. She was feeling very stagnant. She was looking for another place to work. And so I said, hey, how things are going? And she said, you know, they're paying for my my PMP uh, so I can, you know, become a certified project manage, m- manager. And now she's she feels valued. Not that every mm-hmm. company needs to do that, but finding that thing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, that's great. She said, yeah, I, I, I am excited because I'm already seeing a difference in what I'm contributing to the company in addition to making myself more marketable. Um, and But now that allegiance, I think, is there and she might likely stay there a lot longer because they've, they've seen who she is and they want to continue to help her grow. So yeah. it's interesting. I, I've done personal branding in such large Fortune 500s and, um, and Actually, some of those companies have been smart enough to say, yeah, we need to recognize that every individual has a brand of their own um, and start doing that. But many organizations aren't comfortable with that and they block out social media. They block out. They kind of try to bring them into a world that this is the only thing you do here. And then when you're outside, that's your personal life. And that's blending. People are starting to realize Mm -hmm. that's a blended situation. And so you have to allow them to have their voice, their personality into the organization. So um, I, I think it's I think it's changing. I do, um, but there are still large corporations that don't. Uh, they look at that as oh, oh, that person's preparing to leave instead of that person's preparing to actually uh, kind of grow within the company and elevate themselves into another area. So um, I hear a lot of people who say, you know, I'm going to learn PMP or I'm going to go take this extra course. I was talking to someone on Saturday that came to talk with me, and um, I suggested he look at Scrum Master and some other things. Um, continue to gain its lifelong learning, gain those skills, put those on on your resume, but also think about how that will help you grow within the organization and try to pick things that will elevate you within that company. Um, even if it's just to go to a company event, you know, that they're, they're winning an award. Hey, I want to come sit at that table. Bring everybody, as many of those people as you can to those awards that they, they feel proud to come to that for their organization. But um, so many people forget that they have their own brand and that they do need to, to elevate that within their own company. And also it's their responsibility to keep learning and keep adding to their organization. And hopefully they feel like they can be innovative within a company. I call it an entrepreneur versus an entrepreneur mm-hmm. inside corporations. So try to find the way to be that entrepreneur and um, elevate elevate your own self. So, I mean, in large corporations, you have those 30, 60, 90, 180 day reviews. And those are your opportunities to keep saying, hey, I'd like to do more or help direct me in the right place. But so many people seem to be, and you know, always wanting to, it's easy to say, I'm unhappy. I'm going to go find the next place. And the grass isn't always greener. Right. Especially because you take you with you. Yeah, that's right. You go no matter where. Right? You just have to be prepared to, to say what it is you want. It's going to elevate you no matter where yeah. you go. Eric, you had talked about, obviously, being mindful. What came to mind for me was being self-reflective uh, and the ability to work through conflict. Do you find that that's one of your roles as well when you're working with organizations and businesses to help cultivate that self-reflection? And then also, how do we work through issues when challenges do show up? Yeah, I think the on the self-reflection, a lot of it is understanding all the learning I can get from different perspectives around the table. And so I keep a, I started journaling maybe 10 years ago. And a lot of what I have in that journal is not only my values and my beliefs, and I'm just trying to understand myself, but it's what am I learning from all the different people around me that I didn't know because if I'm trying to push my own perspective and my own biases to reshape that. And so by me writing it down, I can kind of revisit and say, okay, am I falling back into that bias? And why do I believe that? Why do they believe that? And so self-reflection is a way to do that. I Journaling helps me do that as well. And when we talk today about diversity and inclusion, the diversity does not equal inclusion. And so, um, you know, 
even sitting around this table, the, the famous Google study, uh, Project Aristotle, I think it was, where they talked about what makes effective teams and its psychological safety is the, the mm-hmm. fundamental aspect of that. And part of that study said that, hey, a, a way that you can gauge effectiveness of teams is over time, people sitting around the table on a strong team will speak about the same. You know, so I'm very aware of how much am I speaking relative to David or Robin and, you know, over this hour, maybe a shorter period than they intended. But over this hour, if we're all speaking about the same amount, then that is a sign of psychological safety for a team. And so it's even awareness like that. In inclusion for me, I I whiteboard a lot. So sitting, sitting here is hard for me not to use my hands and get on a whiteboard. But that started from pulling elements of what everybody said in a conversation and putting it on the board. Yes. And so if I'm in a room full of 15 to 20 people doing a two-hour brainstorming session, my goal is that everybody has something that they said on that board and they can see mm-hmm. it on that board. And that is kind of bringing inclusion to life and then translating that into action and making embedding it in our strategy or whatever problem we're trying to solve. And so I think we've got to find ways to uh, push ourselves to think differently, push past our bias, uh, take some self-reflection to do that, and then figure out how to pull other people into the conversation like that. Absolutely. And that was, uh, I think, a core value that Eric and I shared. Um, Coming from a teaching background, I emphasize discourse-based learning. And I knew I was successful as a teacher the less that I talked. And so uh, doing that with other folks in a corporate setting is also uh, tricky. And it it takes an understanding of how to provide that safe space for people to be able to share their ideas, to even get up and physically illustrate them on a board, but to uh, hear other people's solutions in a way that isn't um, doesn't make you feel defensive and doesn't make you feel like your uh, idea isn't winning out, but that the organization is winning out by having as many ideas out there as possible. Mm-hmm. Diversity. Let's talk about diversity. How would y'all define that and where are we finding where we can take more responsibility for that? So I'll, I'll throw something yeah. out there, but then I'll, I'll push it back to Robin because cahoots to me is a model for diversity. And it diversity is all different perspectives. The, the hard part about diversity is finding the, finding the, um, the elements of different perspectives that can come to, together in a solution that unites them. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's usually one solution isn't always right. It's usually finding different solutions. And as I've learned over time, it's better to have buy-in from everybody with a combined solution that pulls in different perspectives than it is to have the, the right solution. I'd rather have buy-in over perfect anytime. Mm-hmm. And buy-in always wins. It's kind of a culture strategy for lunch. Mm-hmm. Buy-in is far more important in, in having a diverse uh, set of perspectives come together in a solution that people believe in collectively, far more important than actually having the right strategy in my mind. And Cahoots has is is been a model for that. Even the, just the feeling when I walked in Cahoots for the first time and you walk around and you go to the, I've been in a lot of co-working spaces and you just go to get coffee. And every time I go, I talk to somebody different about who knows what, but it's, it's always interesting. Yeah. Well, I always say it's diversity, inclusion, and equity. So um, I look at it in those three strands. And um, for me, I, I mean, I, I've always been, I'm called the godmother of cahoots because I've always been the oldest in the group there. Um, and and I've actually enjoyed that. I've learned so much from everybody there. So so really, truly, it's about equitable um, opportunities. And we had that within the foundation as well. And so I, you know, I think we still work for that every day. I know that Jenny and Odine started it cahoots on the on pure fact saying, gosh, I would like to have people that look like me um, in cahoots. And so they've always welcomed everyone um, to cahoots. It doesn't matter age, race, anything. It's always, um, you know, you're, you're welcome there and we'll make a, we'll make it comfortable for you. So, um, but for me, it's truly about diversity is actually giving everybody that that opportunity, that voice. And so that's what, I mean, David and I have worked hard over the last probably eight months, um, really trying to even bring up the website to to show that um, we truly are working towards that 
that common goal for everyone. And and when you look around Cahoots, you do feel that that it is a mix and it feels right there. Um, and so we're we're redoing images. We're making sure people feel comfortable, but we're also making sure that everybody's being brought to the table for their voice. And so the speaker series is going to have a lot of diverse perspectives coming forward. And but it is really, I mean, like Eric said when when he came into it. Um, it's we always have that big uh, the white male thing, right? We say that, but honestly, that's part of the mix as well. We need the white males. Right. In We're the not mix. saying bye bye white male. No, <laughs> we <laughs> We're need, saying yes. We, we need to widen there. it. Yeah. yeah. When Jenny spoke at the summit, she mm-hmm. spoke to. She looked around. Uh, I don't know how long ago it was, mm-hmm. but she looked around cahoots and went. Okay, hang on a second. <laughs> We're still not as a diverse population as we had intended on. So how do we get deliberate about going out and and fixing that and changing right. that? I think it's and I think you mentioned it, Judson, something similar to this. It's about inviting, and, and I think maybe Eric said that too. When when you're when you're going to go do something or you or you're going to take part in a celebration, who can we get outside of our little inner sphere and our network and and make connections with new people who may think differently from us, who may represent a different religion, a different race, a different, you know, age group, whatever it is. And that's how, because of the introductions, we talked about how important it is that when we, we uh, attr- like attracts alike, mm-hmm. like, excuse me, that didn't come out very well. When we can expand our network, then the sky's the limit. We've got um, SciTech Institute that is the foundation for Arizona Tech Council. They sit, used to sit just outside of the studio. They're now downstairs in another building. Um, they're working with kids K-12 to um, have these kids take leadership opportunities. And one of the things I keep hear- hearing their leadership say over and over again is these kiddos, they know who they are and what they what they want. And if we keep shoving our agenda down their throat, we're not going to have a chance to hear from them. So like all of you are saying, let's open it up to, you know, what do you, what do you have to say? Let's make everybody count. And I love what you shared about the safety piece. I never really looked at it through that lens. But as an edu- educator, that's what I always look for, that opportunity to make people feel comfortable and heard. And I think that's one of the core values mm-hmm. that you're saying that that you all focus on as well. Yeah. yeah. We also have um, two new interns. One happens to be right from downtown Phoenix and is working through the YMCA here. And another is from Belgium, who is here for four months. So we really truly look international. And um, we've always done that where you have to bring every different type of perspective in. And uh, this young gal, Oster from Belgium, is amazing in building community. She doesn't have anybody around her, so she's talking to every business there, getting to know them, making them feel welcome. Um, and and we tend to st- sit back and think, oh, okay, well, we're just here to run the building. No, we're here to bring that community together. And here's this person who comes from Belgium who's done that in two weeks. She knows more people in that place than probably I do. It's amazing. So I love the different perspectives that everybody brings to the the table and how they bring everybody's voice out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I think it, it, oh, sorry, uh, another part is kind of the the, the purpose, purposeful inclusion of people that aren't like you. So versus while, real quick, what's the opposite of that? Just doing it to do it. Yeah, yeah. So just not not making a seat at the table and and kind of allowing people to step forward. I think just to kind of speak back to what Eric was saying about people feeling comfortable and safe. I think for for underrepresented populations or people of color, a lot of times it's not a, a safe space to step forward, even if there is a table at the or a chair at the table for them to sit. Um, so trying to kind of cultivate that, um, you know, this, the safety aspect of it, but also uh, making people feel like uh, you, you are very purposely creating an opportunity for them, uh, because a lot of times it doesn't necessarily look like what it does for others. Uh, so for me, it's, it's, it's kind of a little bit broader and nuanced, but, but still having uh, the diversity and perspective, diversity in person, diversity in sex, diversity in color. So just if, if you can kind of create a situation that promotes all of those things, I think you kind of have a perfect storm. Yeah, this is what I find so exciting about the concept of entrepreneurship 
and it's something that is uh, expanding freedom. It's allowing people to work in new ways and come together in new ways, but freedom is predicated on equality. So you have to create uh, an environment in which everyone is equal, and then just as David said, then they can come forward with the skills that they have and have opportunities for leadership and opportunities to be led because that's another part of leadership is allowing other people to uh, take the lead in a way that allows you to do what you do well and you can support them as well. So uh, we find in thinking about entrepreneurship, we're also, Summit is very dedicated to scaling innovation and allowing organizations to create collaborative environments for you know, purposeful creativity and thinking about how to do that. Everything we see shows that diversity drives creativity and uh, all sorts of things that maybe you don't think about in terms of ability when you are designing software or products and services. The more people who can help view a problem from their angle, the more uh, diverse your solution will be and the more people you can serve. Mm -hmm. You talked some said something about scalability. What are some of the challenges moving a small business to enterprise? I, I'm a very small business owner, and I have dreams much like Cahoots to be in a lot of different locations. But how do you help people and organizations scale like that? Yeah, I think the, you know, we've seen three things come up repeatedly aside from funding. You know, cash flow and funding is, is something that a lot of people have to deal with. But if you can... Uh, we we start oftentimes with business that are profitable, so they have some funding, they have a model that works. Now they're trying to get it, you know, get it bigger and make a bigger impact. So it starts with you have to have repeatable processes and infrastructure. Otherwise, you, you have to have something that you can start to delegate and empower, right? You have to be able to build a team and bring in other people that can operate as effectively as you are in serving your customers and doing whatever it is that you do. Therefore, you actually have to document that and you have to set some standards. And uh, whether that be embedded in technology, uh, written processes, or whatever that is, you, you need some scalable infrastructure. And I think a lot of people struggle with that because you – as the founder, oftentimes small companies, you're so good at what you do, you feel like nobody Hold else can do it. Everything. Yeah, yeah. And so you don't want to give that up. But ultimately, you have to, it's a bit of what we're even trying to do with Summit is how do you get it into a teachable uh, uh, approach that somebody else can then pick up so you can go on and, and do the bigger things that you need to do to scale. So that's the first piece. The, th the second thing is leadership. So when you're, as Judson and I often talk, leading yourself, and uh, and to get things done versus leading others versus then leading leaders versus then leading a business. Those are different levels of leadership that require you to step back, expand your horizon at every step, coach and empower the people uh, below and around you in a different way at every step, and oftentimes redefine your identity at each step. So it's going from a founder entrepreneur to a CEO, as a CEO, oftentimes you're more outward facing than you are inward facing. You're not so much the person that always is getting things done. You're the person that is out in the market talking to customers and shaping this vision and strategy for the company. It's a different identity. And then the final thing is uh, culture. And so a lot of a lot of companies, as they as I've talked to companies that uh, are growing and moving into different spaces, they struggle to maintain their culture as they're bringing new people in. And so that's where defining your values and what you want to be as a company and an identity and, and being very intentional about that and who you hire, hiring people that share a passion for what you're trying to do, hire people that share values uh, with what you're trying to do to help to uh, keep the culture that you had, which is really important for your success. And how do you balance immediate expectations and long-term expectations? Especially when you're scaling, how how do you help businesses do that? Yeah, it's it's really hard because you you have the short term things that are just survival mode, right? There's certain things to just survive and and you know be able to pay your employees and make uh, make a payroll, uh, and then you have to if you don't though, as you're doing some of that, put in in place some long term fixes. Uh, so once in a while, when you solve a problem, you've got to think broadly and and think about is it not just getting me through survival, but onto scalability. Mm -hmm. Out of five problems you solve each day, if you can pick one and say, you know what, this one I'm going to take and I'm going to solve it in a way so that it doesn't happen again, which then goes to scalability, you've, you've got to start to find some balance that way because you can get stuck in that downward spiral of firefighting all day mm -hmm. long and then you never get out of it. Yeah, creating a learning culture, uh, being humble yourself, 
you know. Uh, the, the other scalability um, does depend on being able to delegate, which is the number one problem I run into with entrepreneurs. The second problem I often see, though, is that they're more in love with their solution than the problem. And being willing to be humble about that, being able to pivot, and then creating a culture where people are empowered to bring solutions to you is, is key to being able to scale, I've found, too. Because, again, if you think you are the, the fountainhead of all ideas, then uh, that's only as far as your company could ever go. Tell us a little bit more about uh, the impact that you're looking to have with Summit. And I would love for each of you to speak to that, but let's start with Eric. Yeah, I'll start at just at a very high level. And then, you know, this group has helped me shape it and, and think more deeply about it. But a little over a year ago, I sat down with a good friend of mine over Thanksgiving break, uh, Aaron Connor, and we were talking about uh, you know, I felt a desire to give back and I just wanted to, I, you see all the conflict in the world and you say, what can I do and what can I do that is, um, will keep me inspired and may, may inspire others just by sharing, uh, sharing my story. And, uh, he, you know, he kept saying, what do you really want to do? What do you really want to do? And I finally said, I want to make a positive impact on a billion people, mm-hmm. you know? So that was my higher purpose. And I said, okay, that, you know, he, he kind of pulled it out of me and he's a mindfulness practitioner and, and so from that moment on, it, it set my sights a little bit higher in terms of what am I really trying Just to a do? a little bit higher? <laughs> a, a lot higher. <laughs> a lot higher. <laughs> and if you, what I found is, um, you know, I have, I've believed in persistence and grit over time. You know, it's the 10,000 hours, whatever you, uh, the outliers, whatever you want to, however you want to look at it. I have pursued things over years and decades. And that's, you know, I, I've gotten where I have from hard work. It's just doing the small things over and over and over again repetitively. And so that's my strength. And so if I put that out there, it may take me 50 years to do that. I don't know. But uh, by by setting my sights there, it's, it's kind of a neat uh, North Star for me that gives me some inspiration when I, you know, if I uh, get mired in the day-to-day, you know, I have three kids at home and we have all kinds of fun stuff going on all the time. And then when I take a step back to think about what can I really do to make a difference and I think back on that even that moment of make a positive impact on a billion people, it makes me uh, both grateful for what I have, and then it makes me uh, want to just look for people I can help every day. And if nothing else, just doing one positive thing for a person every day can help you on that journey. And it gives me something tangible that I can do every day, and uh, which feels good. Mm-hmm. Wow. I feel like I need to raise a glass to that. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I would love if anybody else wants to speak to their North Star. What What is it? What is your big? Well, for me and my business, it's always been, I believe everybody has PP, which is perfect potential. And because of that, I always wanted to help people find their voice and put it out there into the world. So it's very similar to how Jenny looks at things. She also says that we want to, we want to change the face of entrepreneurship and we want to give everyone a voice. And um, in doing that, we're trying to look at how can we be collaborative with communities, with Uh, executives from companies, advisors, bring all of that to the table to actually raise um, entrepreneurs' opportunities in the organizations um, that they want to build. So it's really a purpose-driven workspace, but it's really, uh, it's about placemaking, about um, collaboration, and about um, kind of growing at scale if they can. So we've, we're working at building a programming into Cahoots and and beyond, um, which takes people from a learning hub to a tri-lab to um, rapid launch and then grow and scale. And so that's how I, Eric and Jenny and I started talking originally was, you know, he was at the grow and scale stage. And I kept saying, uh, 10 million to 100 million, how about just 250,000 to a million, right? Mm-hmm. So how do people just grow from that stage? And so there's, there, he can advise at any level, which is amazing. And so, and so can Judson on the leadership side and, and David on the, on the digital marketing side. So bringing advisors to all stages of an entrepreneur and helping them think this way, um, just like you said, you know, you're trying to figure out how do I go from that next level, um, that next stage. So everybody has that desire. They might not necessarily want to scale, but they might just want to grow in different ways. And so thinking about, you know, that and and giving people that voice and, and helping them figure out that next step is really kind of how Cahoots is looking at it is there's stages in that process. And even from a million to two million and two million to three, I mean, there's a lot that has to happen um, in each of those stages. So, um, so I think Summit is um, well prepared to help any level, um, but definitely has that, um, that core uh, opportunity at, at, at staging at, at, you know, the, 
the billion, getting to a billion uh, people out there in any way you can, but really focusing on those companies that want to go from a million and up um, is a really great um, kind of sweet spot, I think. And when you're a business owner and you're so focused on those goals and your employees and your team and all the stakeholders, you may feel like you have this goal out here, but until you have someone like you in your life to help you strategically get there, right? Uh, yeah. you have to get out of your own way, right? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. you can objectively look at that and help them get there. Yeah. And one of the things that I, part of our approach is we ask a lot more questions than we do provide answers, right? So it's very much trying to, it's the thought that a lot of times the answer is within the, the person or the company. And so we have a series of questions that we go through to understand what they're really trying to do. And oftentimes we can get to somebody's higher purpose, just like my friend did for me. And, uh, you know, and so like the first time I met David, we sit down at a conversation and I, I start talking and, and when I know he's a good fit to work with is when he's building on my conversation, you know, he's an active listener as well. And then I can listen to him and I'm, as he's talking, I'm not preparing a response. It's getting my, I'm thinking about, I'm adding what he's saying to my thought process and we're coming together in a half hour conversation. We can come up with something bigger than either one of us had when we started. Same with Judson. And so that that's a bit of a test when we're working together and that you see that conversation building. And that's a bit of what we're trying to, it's the chemistry we're trying to bring to companies, recognizing that, hey, oftentimes if we just facilitate a good conversation within the people in that business, we can help help you navigate through a lot of what you may already know and then just simplify it and give you an action plan to support it. Yeah, absolutely. My background as a history teacher taught me that uh, more than anything, I want people to understand that the the world is a result of past actions and, and that we've created it. And that's exciting, but it also uh, creates a lot of responsibility. And so moving forward, as we've talked about, people used to think about, well, how do I become the best employee or how do I have my best career? We really should be asking, how do I lead my best life? And so that's what I think Summit is trying to do because the funny thing is, in a sense, we're all entrepreneurs now. We all have our brands on social media. The fact that we're connected 24-7 has uh, liberated us in some ways, but it's also chained us in some ways. And so thinking about how to not be so compartmentalized between your identity as an employee and, and your personal life and then feeling that safe space to bring the ideas that you experience maybe when you're not thinking about work, to work uh, helps you be more of a a thinker and a part of an organization where you feel like you are contributing to its purpose. And uh, all of us want that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Judson and David both, did you have an opportunity to share with us what your, I'm going to call it a big audacious goal. I know that's not my term, it's somebody else's, but what What is it that you say you get up every day and, and you mentioned early on how important family is? I don't know if that was on air or off air, but what is it for you that, that you are inspired to do in your career? I think I just want to make a, a, a true impact. I think in, in the past when, when I've worked on projects or things, it's like you hit a button and it goes out into the world and you don't know what it's doing or who it's affecting or who it's helping. Um, and a lot of times from a marketing side, that's it gets tricky because you are always trying to sell something, right? It's like, so you want to make it look like maybe something that it's it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it's trying to find products, people, and, and tools that you can push out into the world that you know are going to make a true difference in people's life um, and just become transformative. You know, it's like reading a book for one person, they might get one thing out of it. Another person might get another thing out of it, but trying to take those lessons, put them into some type of process or tool that you can then apply to your life and make sure that that person is, is getting something out of it and kind of moving themselves forward. Can I say I would die on the vine if I wasn't always growing and learn? Mm-hmm. I, I can't. Yeah. And I know there's some people who are very content just kind of doing their thing clocking in nine to five, coming home, doing some yard work, cleaning, you know, washing the car, playing with the kids and getting up the next day and doing over. I, I have that entrepreneur spirit and that, that learner in me that says, I've got to find another way to reinvent myself. I, I don't know how to not do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely tough. I think, uh, cause you get into the practice of kind of habit 
So even when you do have things like that, if it just becomes ritualistic in a sense. So I think having those big goals, like Eric says, to make a difference in a billion people's lives, it's if you can always keep that at the forefront of your your thoughts and, and the things that you're kind of doing, it, it kind of changes the way you navigate your day or, or can change how you're looking at a situation. You know, if you just get up that morning and you're like, okay, I'm just going in to punch the clock again. You know, if you just change your perspective or kind of have a shift in the way you're looking at it, can make a huge difference in what you're willing to put forth for the day. And Eric, you help people do that. You help leaders really get mindful around that, like this friend of yours did for you. Is that right? That's part of that's part of this opportunity with Summit. It is, yeah. So we start by helping companies understand the purpose and the impact that they're trying to make in the world. And it's beyond financials, right? So financials is a piece of it. But if you start to understand your business, your business model, your values, and then you look at maybe social causes that align with those, then you can scale your impact. And the more these days, as Justin talk about, talked about, your the relationships you have in the ecosystem are far beyond just suppliers and customers of your business. It's, it's everybody, and it becomes part of your brand. And the more you can tie to social causes, the more you can build bridges, the more you can create a positive impression of your brand and your identity as a company. And all that is good. And so if you start there, and then you understand, then you have to take a, a really honest look at how where you're at today. And a lot of businesses, you, you get so caught up in the firefighting and uh, and just survival that you don't necessarily take a hard look at the numbers and how are you really performing? What are your what are your customers really telling you? How is your how profitable are you really? And as you start to look at that, then you can start to build a path to get from here to there and uh, develop a playbook of building the habits into your business consistently over time, repeatable uh, that you can then get from here to there. But it you know breaking through kind of the cloud of uncertainty as we talk about to figure out where you're really trying to go an honest look at where you're really at today and a common understanding. Oftentimes, if you have co-founders, as an example, they both have a different perspective mm-hmm. of how the business is doing. And so build that common understanding. You can build the path to get from here to there and then help to help to coach people along that journey. Well, another part of Summit that you haven't even talked about, so I'm going to force you to talk about it, um, is that there are – it's going to grow and you have this – this number seven does have purpose in there and there are these seven pursuits. I think you should talk about that because there is – that's the part I really loved about working with you is that you're really truly about the employees and bringing them up and how you work with them um, in a huge organization. But it, it really helps, uh, I think, an entrepreneur to think that way. Yeah, I think the it, it started for me as I as I took on a big leadership role uh, where I'm at now with Boeing. I had to I had to align values in all aspects of my life. So I was a business leader. I'm a father. Uh, I'm a author, entrepreneur, and uh, and I also take my health and mindfulness and uh, very um, seriously because I want to be there for my kids. Right. So it all kinds of kind of ties together. So I started to align my values and try to be the same person in all aspects, and then align my activities with that. And so you start to realize that, hey, if you show up as a, as a whole person, you can maintain energy in all aspects of your life. And then you can kind of balance those identities and make sure you're prioritizing where, like David, family is is most important to me. And so as I'm on a conference call with Robin, oftentimes my daughter might be sitting on my lap. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's kind of nice. You, you find that balance. And so although we're starting with business purpose, we want to we want to help people find who they are as a complete person and how do they... Uh, how do they develop that? And by doing that, that's really where your your entire potential is. And, um, you know, as I think about the, the three keys to engagement, purpose, autonomy, and mastery are three things that I've kind of come up with. For mastery, if you see a lot of athletes talk, mastery is boring. When you're, you know, shooting the best, shooting free throw, throws for a thousand times a night for 20 years, that gets boring. So whatever you choose to pursue in mastery, you have to have a personal passion for. And so understanding your personal passions and how that might translate into work or other aspects of your life are really important. And so the the other, the seven summits are uh, a recognition that uh, we've got to talk to the whole person Mm -hmm. and help people explore who they are completely what are those identities and how can they move uh, between those different roles effectively and, and create balance? Absolutely. One way that I know I'm successful is by becoming obsolete. 
And the less my clients need me or the less my students rely on me and can think for themselves, the better job I know that I'm doing. And like Eric said, I'm very much more driven by questions than answers and helping other people think critically because the questions of today will not be the questions of tomorrow. And if you truly want to have a learning organization that's capable of growing and innovating, then you have to allow people to think for themselves and feel safe expressing that. Mm. Great place to end our segment. You all have really uh, inspired me. I'm I'm reaffirmed in who I am and as I show up in this world. It's great to hang out with folks like you. And I love the collective, right? You each are individuals. And yet you very much have found your way to share and celebrate and take each of your businesses to the next level, right? Including Patrick here behind me doing video mm-hmm. behind the scenes. You really have formed an amazing um, alliance. And it's really great to share in space with you. Before we close out the segment, if each of you could one more time, just say your name, uh, the company that you represent or organization, and then where we can find you uh, on the World Wide Web, on the Google. And if you're on social media, just give a shout out to where we might find you there. David, would you start for us? Sure. David Bird, the Original Crew Company. You can find us at OriginalCrewCo.com. All right. And Eric Strafel, EricStrafel.com, or I'll let Justin talk to you, Summit. Uh, Robin Brammon, Cahoots.com, and you can find us on every single social site in the world <laughs> under Cahoots. Yes. Excellent. Judson Garrett, I'm Chief Learning Office for, Officer for Summit. You can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Excellent. And at Summit.com. Very good. And spell it for us. S-U-M-M-I-7. Excellent. So there's the number seven at the end. Yeah. And once this is repurposed as a podcast, we'll have each of your bios and your company information as well as any of those social media uh, links and and your websites as well. So, again, thank you all for being here. It's been a great pleasure to have you today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You've been listening to Phoenix Business Radio, broadcasting live from within the MAC 6 in Conscious Capitalism, Arizona, Business Radio X Studio. Some media leans left, some leans right. And we lean business. Until next time, thank you for listening. (laughs) 